We need to uh, touch on an important presentation. Uh, the Permanent Secretary talked about uh, uh, Zimbabwe company, Itai Masawembe, who um, is going to make our next presentation. More importantly, he's going to touch on one of the most relevant subjects uh, for all African countries, and that is uh, the vastness of the rural areas and the rural populations. I don't want to steal Itai's thunder, but for example, there are eight and a half thousand schools in Zimbabwe, um, and they're not necessarily concentrated in Harare and Bulawayo. There's over 7,000 in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. So the big issue, and when we talk about these ICTs for education, is the connectivity of those schools and the remoteness and how do you overcome, how do you find uh, economic, economically viable solutions uh, to uh, that big question, that big problem. So let's give Itai a warm welcome. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I am one person between you and your lunch. <laughs> so I'm going to ask you to walk with me for the next few seconds. We have had all the presentations amazing stuff that is coming out from Education Development Trust, amazing presentations that uh, our friend Mark East from Microsoft has shared with us. But I would like you to imagine, close your eyes, close your eyes, imagine a scenario where you are able to create and distribute all your educational resources and make them available to every rural school in your country. Imagine. Imagine where you have the capacity to deliver teacher training 24-7 to all your educators in the rural areas. Work with me. Imagine the possibility of having real-time data on every activity that is taking place in your rural schools. What do you see? What kind of a ministry of education will you be running? What kind of a school will you be running? Now, in that imagination, the only thing that's standing between you and that reality is connectivity. I'm here to share with you how, for no more than $2 a day, we are able to provide unlimited broadband to an entire school 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We are going to run this presentation with my colleague. He handles the difficult questions, so I'm going to leave the second part of the conversation on the technical issues. But before we start showing how it works, maybe can I share with you a story? We work with ministers of education, governments, specific schools in four major areas. The first one is we work with them to create roadmaps or not to transform the education systems. We believe that an effective roadmap is key for a sustainable economic development to be able to have citizens with 21st century skills that are job ready and relevant. We aggregate content from the best developers in the world and make it available to our partners so that it begins to kickstart the provision and acquisition of 21st century schools. We also do a lot of teacher training. In Zimbabwe, we've done at least 23,000 teachers in professional development, not just on end-user ICT schools, but more importantly on new teaching and learning methodologies that enable them to start to infuse the 21st century skills in the learners. 
And there's a reason why we do ICT at the last, because it's only but an enabler. It is not our core business, we're an education company. In 2009, a school principal approached us and she had three problems that she was concerned about. One was a low pass rate. Her concern was her kids or her school's pass rate was below the national pass rate. The second one was she had a low collection rate of school fees. I guess maybe the parents were not seeing the return on the education investment. The third one, not many students were coming into school. So we sat down and designed a solution. We deployed education training programs for the teachers, digital content resources, and PCs, because at that time, the PCs were right at the peak in our market. The impact of that is what you see here. In 2009, and look at that. We have, so you've got your average rate for the grade seven, and they moved to 68% within one year. Before we could figure out what was happening, they were already sitting at 75%. Within five years, they were hitting 97%. This is an urban school, low fee paying. It's not a private school with well resourced. In fact, 1,200 kids were sharing 21 computers. We then worked with Minister of Information Communication Technology on a project where they wanted us to see if this could work in a rural school. A school that's just on the outskirts of Harare in an area called Domboshawa, it's called Choguguza. And here are the results. Within nine months of deploying our solution, the pass rate for that school went up above the national pass rate. You as educators, you know the principle that's at work here. We were able to solve the two sigma principle. The two sigma problem from our famous Blooms that he left with us in 1984. That if you are able to simulate a one-to-one -one experience and also improve the mastery of content, you can increase the academic performance of your learner by a factor of 98%. So what's stopping us? He called it a two sigma problem because it was a problem. How do you simulate in a country with four and a half million learners, how do you then have four and a half million teachers? It's impossible. But advances in technology has enabled us to make our content not only media rich, but highly interactive. Connectivity becomes a key enabler, not just to address an instructional problem that we face in many of our schools, but in equitable provision of quality education to rural schools. The system that we've designed enables all ministries of education school districts, provinces, to be able to distribute content, to provide professional development, to make that dream, the imagination that you had, to make it real, to make it real. And we are going to show you how it's done in the next few minutes. To be able to run an education system that is data-driven, at any point you can decide, I want to find out the attendance of girls in this region. I want to find out the performance of my students in this area. And that is the power of the network we have created. For just two dollars is for the school. It is not for the one user, it is for the school. 1,000 students, 1,500 learners, unlimited broadcast, unlimited broadband to support your schools. So we were asked by government to help connect schools. 
2,000 schools specifically. So in preparation for that assignment, we made a survey. We wanted to find out what were the technologies that were being used in our schools. What were they using them for? To what extent had they been deployed? In that survey, we established that the bulk of our schools that had some reasonable broadband were using ADSL, our famous old copper. I don't know, maybe in some of your countries, you have some of the schools on this platform. The second largest deployment was coming from VSAT, then followed by fiber. Many of the schools that are on ADSL and fiber, we found out they are located in predominantly rural in urban areas. The further away you moved from the urban centers, the less occurrence you would find of ADSL and for that matter fiber, unless the school was within a backbone reach of a fiber that was coming through this area. We have saw some schools that are still in LTE, and so we asked them, what, why are you not having this? And the explanation was, why are you not having as many ADSL on your platform? The reality was, well, not many schools actually have landlines. We kind of leapfrogged a certain stage and just went on to mobile to try and run a fixed line for a school that's probably 200, 300 kilometers from now may not be commercially viable. In fiber, it's the same thing, if not worse. So the wired solutions are solutions that become very unaffordable for the majority of our rural schools, which left, leaves us with two, with just the wireless solution, primarily VSAT and mobile. So we wanted to find out why, with many of our countryside covered by mobile, why are our schools not using mobile? We wanted to find out. So we went to the market, went on the ground and find out. What we found was very interesting. Cisco shared with a report, this is available, and it shows the availability of mobile coverage across the world. While there are places in Africa that have some 4G, the number is so small that it is difficult to plot it on the map. The number of sites that have 4G in Africa, in South America, and for that matter, Australia, are so small compared to what you find in North America that they don't exist when you want to plot them on the, on the, on the map. So when did to find out? So why is it we don't have the broadband available in our rural schools? There's partly the answer. But where it is, where we have 3G, why is it not being used to support broadband? We got the answers from Ericsson. Ericsson shared with us an amazing report demonstrating that when you look at the mobile revenue, mob, revenue for mobile companies on a year on year growth from 2010 to 2017, you are seeing a 2.6 revenue. But if you look at the consumption or demand for data, Seventy-four plus percent. Those two graphs don't meet. It's commercially unviable at this moment for telecommunication companies to provide mobile broadband to our schools, particularly our rural schools. And that explains why we have, where a school is in an area covered by mobile broadband, the school is not using it. Let me use an example here, much closer for those who are from Zimbabwe. Uh, who is familiar with the platform called WhatsApp? WhatsApp? Yes, WhatsApp. Uh, can somebody here tell me the cost of a WhatsApp bundle for a month in Zimbabwe? What's your best price for WhatsApp? $3. And how much data do you get on $3?
250 megabytes. How much e-learning can you do on 250 megabytes? And how many of our learners can afford $3 a month? If it's a school with 1,000 students, that will come to $3,000 a month. Our rural schools cannot afford that. Even if we ask telecom companies to reduce that by 50%, not many of our schools can even begin to think that they can pay $1,500. So that is the reality we faced as we are trying to implement a connectivity solution for the Ministry of Education. So mobile, where it is, is unaffordable. In some cases, it's totally what? Unavailable. Fiber can't get to our rural schools. We have had numerous discussions about terrestrial solutions. We have tried UHF. We put in some must in the country. We're running a, a, a radius of 80 kilometers with some of the technologies. But every time we required a line of sight, it created huge problems for our sites. We tried a lot of all these technologies that would make sure, that assumed that there's a certain infrastructure in place, which made it very difficult because that infrastructure was in, wasn't in place. If you look at the provision of a TV signal, a, many parts of our rural areas don't actually get the TV signal. So you'd need to build infrastructure to extend the reach. Which left us with just one practical solution. Visage. But all of us, or some of us, have a very, after, a very bad aftertaste with Visat. We have had, in circumstances where Visat has been very expensive when we are uploading our resources onto the platform. And we have spent a couple of years working with our partners globally to figure out how best to overcome this problem. And so my colleague here, who is uh, much smarter than me, so he's going to take us through the, some technical explanation on how this is possible, how we reduce the cost of uh, satellite broadband into our schools. A Amazônia é caracterizada pela grandiosidade de seus recursos naturais e imensa biodiversidade. Porém, a realidade dos habitantes desta região e seus desafios diários ainda são pouco conhecidos pelo restante do país. Devido ao isolamento geográfico da maioria dos municípios, existem enormes dificuldades que impedem que a população tenha acesso a uma educação de qualidade. Para ultrapassar tais barreiras, a tecnologia é a ferramenta utilizada pelo governo do Amazonas para encurtar distâncias e levar a educação aos lugares longínquos do maior estado brasileiro. Implantado em 2007, o Centro de Mídias da Educação do Amazonas, Semean, é um projeto pioneiro no país, que a cada ano é ampliado pelo governo do Amazonas por meio da SEDUC. As aulas acontecem por meio do sistema de IPTV, com interatividade de som, imagens e dados. Nos estúdios do Centro de Mídias, professores ministram aulas transmitidas em tempo real. Na outra ponta, um professor que desempenha o papel de mediador, coordena as aulas na classe da comunidade rural. A tecnologia permite que professores e alunos interajam como se ambos estivessem no mesmo espaço físico. Através de um processo de educação dinâmica enriquecido por animações, ilustrações e os mais modernos conteúdos com recursos de computação gráfica, a iniciativa do Centro de Mídias é premiada e reconhecida internacionalmente. São importantes prêmios de inclusão digital e inovação na educação que demonstram que o governo do Estado avança em prol da educação do Amazonas graças a um projeto que já mudou a vida de mais de 300 mil estudantes de mais de 3 mil comunidades que hoje têm acesso ao ensino médio e ensino fundamental com um aumento na taxa de aprovação em mais de 80%. E 
e tantos resultados positivos, o trabalho do governo do Amazonas não para e continua investindo na estrutura e ampliação do centro de mídias, levando educação básica para um número cada vez maior de comunidades rurais, sendo muitas vezes a única chance de estudantes de localidades remotas de ingressar em um curso de nível superior gratuito e com bons índices de qualidade. Então espero que os senhores venham super motivados. Beijo! Até amanhã! Centro de Mídias da Seduc. Tecnologia e conhecimento para o desenvolvimento do Amazonas. One, two, testing. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed that video. So, I've, sp I've spent some time in Brazil, in the state of Amazon, monitoring, observing how this solution works. So, I would urge you to come to our booth and we can get you in touch with our partners in Brazil and I would encourage you to pay them a visit, especially uh, the secretaries of education. It is a trip that I believe will be worthwhile because you get to see the solution I'm going to talk about in action. So, um, at, the, at the end of his presentation, my colleague stated that VSAT kind of left a bad aftertaste for quite a number of people who had gone for it as an option for connectivity. And so, in my presentation, I'm going to illustrate where some of that bad taste could have come from. And I'm also aware that amongst us here, some amongst us here are wondering, well, what is it about VSAT that we have found out that you don't know, which makes it so attractive? And, and so I'm going to get there. Uh, just uh, walk with me. So when, when it became obvious that VSAT was the most practical solution, in terms of rolling it out, we were also aware that it had the following challenges. Okay, I'll skip this one. This, I'm changing the script. So, we realized that VSAT, and this is perhaps part of the biggest contributor of the aftertaste. VSAT, especially here in Zimbabwe, the bandwidth costs were very high. The operating costs were very high. The CPE, not a big deal. But we noticed, for example, that schools that had opted for the VSAT solution, their data plan would get finished by the time they were on the third week of every month. And these data plans were not cheap data plans. These were data plans of 50 US dollars. 50 US dollars a month. By the third week, that data plan would get exhausted and schools would go unconnected for the coming two to three weeks in some cases. So the VSAT solution that we were looking at was one that was going to drastically reduce the operating cost around bandwidth. Then the next issue that we needed to attend to was the fitness for purpose. And you would agree with me that even if you get a solution for free, if that solution does not fit 
the purpose that is in, it is intended for, then for all practical purposes, it's very expensive. You can get something for free, but if it doesn't get the job done, you're pretty much going to be wasting your time using it. So we needed to come up with a cost-effective solution with respect to bandwidth costs, but also one solution that was fit for purpose. And if I may sort of take you a step back, a question was asked. How much e-learning would a school run with 250 megabits of data? That speaks to the fitness for purpose. So you could pay nothing for 250 megabytes of data, but what are you going to do with it? It's perhaps not fit for purpose. So in coming up with a cost-effective solution, Vsat solution, we also had to think in terms of uh, fitness for purpose. The Vsat solution needed to interoperate with other networks, that is interoperability, but also on this Vsat network, we were going to use other technologies like laptops, like virtual reality terminals, like uh, a lot of what I would call um, data input places coming from all over the place. So we needed to come up with an interoperability, inter interactivity solution. So here is the solution. I need to go a step back. So in response to managing the data, the cost of bandwidth, we came up with a hybrid solution. What we did was we looked at the space segment and we shaped it in a manner that provided for broadcast, which is a cheaper way of moving data, as well as interactivity, which was speaking to fitness for purpose. So interoperability and interactivity, we came up with a protocol that we call Internet Relay Media Protocol. This is a collection, we install this on, a, on servers that we deploy on all the telcoms that are participating on Vsat so that we are able to interoperate between or among networks, but also we are able to have a consistent, a consistent uh, presentation of information to the learners. Now, okay, not there, not there, not there. Okay, great. Right. So, just walk with me here. We are looking at cost of bandwidth, we are looking at fitness for purpose, interoperability and interactivity. So I just said that we came up with a clever way of shaping the space segment so that we can have a very, I don't want to use the term cheap, but a very affordable way of taking data to the schools. So what we did there was we took advantage of the multicasting technology. Multicasting technology is a technology that is used to broadcast data that is from one point to multiple points. But the beauty about it is that you need only one meg to push the data, in our case, and one meg to, to go down to all the schools. You don't have to multiply it. So if you have one school, you need one load, one meg down from your transponder to the school. If you have 100 schools, you still are going to use one meg. That is what the multicasting technology enables you to do. Then, for fitness of purpose, we know through experience that one-way communication is not very effective in, in terms of creating an instructional environment you always need interactivity. So again, we, in a clever manner, we shaped to create 
not as much as one meg return path for interactivity. In fact, in our solution, you only need a maximum of 300 kilobytes of data. That's why the $2 per day makes sense. So we, in a clever way, we shaped the space segment to enable uh, broadcasting as well as interactivity. Now, so that is communication between our hub, which is here in Harare, to any school that could be here in Zimbabwe or uh, any other country. So how does it look like to the Department of Education? It's going to look like that. I hope you can read it. So on your right, there is that uh, big antenna called Teleport Hub. That's where our education services are going to be sitting. E-learning software, that's also where we are going to be broadcasting. The studios will be sitting there. So we push, we need a one meg link up to the transponder. Then from the transponder, we broadcast to either the head office of the Department of Education, provincial office, all the way down to the school. All at $2 a day per month for a school. Thank you for listening.